From freshmen on campus in the 70s to the man leading a private university into the 2020s and beyond, Tim Cost marks 10 years as president for Jacksonville University, his view on making a difference for his alma mater. And what a difference a few years could make to the riverfront in Jacksonville. Leaders in the downtown development world explain how all the pieces fit together. Plus, the citywide election cycle ramps up in the River City. Another candidate in the run for mayor making his case on our show. Brian Griffin joins us on This Week in Jacksonville. Thanks for being with us today. Jacksonville University's 12th president is celebrating 10 years in his role. Tim Cost sat with me this week to discuss what he calls a transformational era in the school's history. It all started with his first impression, the day he moved to Arlington for college. I first came onto campus in uh, August of 1977. Never saw the campus before. There was no internet. My parents weren't going to drive me from upstate New York to Florida to look at things. I was a baseball player, was an excellent scholarship package. I came down to play ball and we drove up. I can still picture it. We had just dropped my brother off, my older brother at James Madison University. We drove up and there were students out lounging, throwing the Frisbee, hanging out in the main quad. My dad turned to me in his old Ford LTD, said, son, you're going to be fine. And the car slowed down, the door opened, I got out and that was it. That, that, was, that was a day where parents didn't hang around for three days to say goodbye. They had to get back. It was the first time I ever saw the campus. What stood out to you, even that freshman year, and then throughout that four-year career uh, as an undergraduate, that made you go, boy, I've got affection for this place? Sure. It was a, this university was completely different than how I grew up, which was a, you know, a predominantly narrow, of its class, white, New York, upstate. Uh, come down here. First time I ever heard that many languages, saw that many colors, uh, people of, of not only nationalities, but interests and tastes. Um, and it just completely opened my eyes. Second of all, it was the warmest weather I'd ever seen in my life growing up in Syracuse, New York, where you got 150 inches of snow. But it was kind of this richness of the experience. And I was blessed that in my four years, Fran Kinney became president. So the recollections are so clear of Going, coming down here to be an athlete and spending all your time on the baseball field. And then Fran emerging in 1979 after my sophomore year to be the president. And then seeing her everywhere. And somewhere filing away, that's what a leader does. They serve. And I learned a ton. I had most of my interaction with Fran Kinney after you became president here at JU. What an incredible person. Seems like she was a big inspiration to you. Is that right? She was. Fran Kinney was probably the most clear, direct line between what I had been doing in corporate America for 32 years to higher ed. Uh, even though we lost her a, a week short of 103, she still left us too soon. I'd never seen anybody mean what they say when they say it's not about me, it's about service to others. Uh, extraordinary, positive, powerful, magnetic, electric personality. Um, and I learned a lot. I mean it. I had been in corporate America in reasonably reasonably high roles for three decades, but I learned more in the five or six, first five or six years I was here working with Fran about how to really treat people. Um, she was a revelation. We all miss her. We think of her every day. That's why we built a statue to her so that some of us can go over there and sit there most every day, even for a few minutes. It's good for you. Put your phone away and play with Fran. Yeah, we learn a lot. Did you have much connection with Fran Kinney and JU, the university, during those years you were succeeding in corporate America? Yeah, the career got going early in 81 when I graduated, ended up up in New York. And then as I moved my way from large corporations like Kodak to Bristol-Myers Squibb, ultimately to PepsiCo, Jacksonville, Florida wasn't really in the normal run of the business. Uh, starting in 09, I was invited to be on the board of trustees, so I started coming down regularly. By 10 and 11, I was involved in the fundraising campaigns and writing, helping write the strategic plan. So I would say from 09, 010 up to her passing on Mother's Day in 2020, we saw each other multiple times every week. Always enjoyable, right? Learned so much. You know, one of the things I learned is if you're gonna have lunch with Fran, and you set aside 11.45 to 1.30, you are in trouble. I mean, not Fran, enough time. Not enough time. With Fran, it's, you know, noon to three. And it's, it, it's so enjoyable because she's recalling things. She stays on, she stayed, I still speak in the present. She stayed on top of everything that was going on. She was so sharp on higher ed 
uh, obviously a PhD herself, you know, learned it all in German. She had lots and lots of thoughts for me always on things that were emerging right then. So uh, managed to keep herself current and relevant. And Stephanie and I take that away. Even in her late 90s, she would sit with freshmen at an event I was hosting in this very building. And they would want to talk to her about things in their lives. And she could converse. She wouldn't say, you know, back in my day. It was always about in their day. And boy, oh boy, what a lesson that was. So you, you mentioned Stephanie Cost. Tell me about the process there for uh, someone who's, again, uh, doing well in the corporate world to get to a place where you said, hmm, um, Mrs. Cost, I've got an opportunity. Uh, should we do this? Because it seems clear over these 10 years, it's been you and Stephanie here at the university. Sure. The entire time in my corporate life, Stephanie had been at two Fortune 500 companies, had started her own company, had started her own not-for-profit. I mean, she was a, a force uh, on her own. But because of, you know, we, we would live in Philadelphia, my job was in Manhattan, or I lived uh, in Philadelphia and my job was in Washington, D.C., that kind of thing. There were very few times she and I worked on the same thing together. One of the great attractions of coming to help here, and it is to serve here, had nothing to do with ego or living in warm weather. It was done right, a president first lady partnership could be that. It would be a chance for me to work with somebody who I admired her professional skills enormously. I mean, we've been together for 46 years now. And that's been one of the great upsides to all this is we, we get to move together on making this a better university. We do so many things with the students together and she has a different point of view on many things. Students like her, students trust her, they seek her out. She gives a lot of speeches now. I think it's been good for her. It's been great for us. So it was a big part of the consideration when this first emerged as a consideration from the board, talking to her and then talking to my son, Drew, and my daughter, Melanie, and they were universally for it from the beginning. President Koss says he's more focused on the future than on looking back and that JU has much more to accomplish in the coming decade. And we want to offer you more from that interview with Tim Koss. You're going to find the four personal questions I asked him when you join us on News for Jax Plus. It's available on Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Android TV, and Chromecast. So just search News for Jax on your streaming device to download. And then once you're there, you're going to find this interview under the This Week in Jacksonville channel. Just ahead, it's a collaboration to build up downtown and to bring you the vision of what's happening to the St. John's River. The CEO of the Downtown Investment Authority joining us next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. And we thought it was a pretty interesting event this past week. The City of Jacksonville's Downtown Investment Authority, Department of Parks, Recreation, and Community Services, in collaboration with Build Up Downtown, the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, and Riverfront Parks Now, hosted a free community event. They called it Riverfront 2025, A Look Ahead. That event took place at the Jacksonville Main Public Library multipurpose room. It was on Wednesday night. And joining us right now, Lori Boyer, CEO of Downtown Investment Authority. Why did I think this was interesting? Because it, it seems like these plans all maybe fit together and it was really cool to get the big picture. Is that what folks got to see? Exactly. <laughs> um, and finally, because we often get criticized for one big splash, yeah. but not having a holistic vision for the riverfront. So the attempt here was if you could tolerate the long duration of the meeting was to show people from end to end what was going on both private developments and all of the public parks so it's informational and then also to get public comments on the park designs that were underway and so we we're looking at did video at from, from that meeting and you said the long duration uh, three hours, something like that? Is that we right? had a three hour time slot yes. and the presentation <laughs> ended up being more like an hour and a half, hour 45, but well, it was great. And as we're looking at some of these images, um, that was what stood out to me. I didn't get to attend the event, uh, but saw some of this. Uh, what was the experience for folks coming in and seeing some of these maps and designs and photos and all of that? We were really, first we were really pleased with the attendance. Um, we had over 400 people at the event, and, and that's a huge turnout for any kind of public sure. meeting, especially yeah. where there's not controversy. And the other part of it was that, generally speaking, most people were really excited and very positive about what they were seeing. So, you know, we've made a big effort 
to do a lot of public outreach and we did a design competition on Riverfront Plaza. And then this was the ability to come back and say, okay, we listened and this is what you said you wanted and here it is. So that was really you know, an important message that we wanted to convey that we had been paying attention, all the public outreach, all the surveys people answered and things they have done over the last couple of years are incorporated in one space or another. You, you mentioned to me as we were preparing for the interview that it wasn't just about parks, but clearly that was like audience focus, right? Correct. So to make it this cohesive vision, what we also wanted to show was where the private developments are and how they support and supplement the park development that's going on the riverfront. So while the parks provide a lot of resiliency, you also need restaurants and you also need activities around those to help serve the people who are enjoying the Riverwalk and enjoying those parks. So that gave people a chance to ask the developers themselves questions about timelines, yeah. about what was included and what wasn't. And it also gave them a chance to look at the plans next to one another. Downtown Investment Authority, 10 years, is that right? 10 years that yeah. it's been? 2012 we were created. And so when that was created and then, so you were serving city council, city council president at one point, now in charge of DIA. But uh, in that time, how would you describe the impact DIA has made in bringing together something like this? What's happening in downtown and these plans for 2025 and beyond? Well, from our DIA perspective, you know, it's a concentrated focus on downtown and really an effort at coordination with all of these other organizations. The Parks Department had a presentation, um, had multiple presentations at this program. And one of the things that they were focused on was they're doing wonderful park projects all over town not just on the riverfront, not just in downtown, but they led with that and then broke it down to this particular area to show what the parks are in this area. And I, th I think they, they really did an outstanding job of not just showing the riverfront parks and the riverfront activity, but also broader park development across the city and the wonderful things going on. One of the things I wanted to ask about initially in our reporting, we said, oh, lots of millennials there. But you said that was not the entire scope of the audience. It was pretty broad, the age range, right? It really was. Um, I was surprised at that in the reporting. And from our standpoint, we're very happy that millennials came because they're sometimes a harder group to reach. And it's important that things that we build serve them as well. They're going to be there for a longer period, next sure. generation. But I would say probably a third of the audience were seniors. So you have a lot of seniors downtown and you had others that were interested as well as families. I mean, we had a number of you know, younger adults when, and children that came, so. So uh, there's always some pushback. There's always some people who say, ah, oh, there are plans. We always hear plans. When are we going to do something? <laughs> uh, I, we also had a viewer a comment uh, on our webpage in the story. Can you make it happen sooner, like three years? Because we definitely need more attractions. What's your maybe final argument for folks about why this is important and why going to something like this can be really helpful? Well, part of what we were trying to do is provide that timeline provide those expectations. So some of the things are imminent. The Friendship Fountain, for example, has been under construction for a couple years and is due to reopen later this year. So you'll be, it will be something you can enjoy. Some parts will be opening maybe December of 23. Other things, right after Jazz Festival, Riverfront Plaza will close and it will begin construction. Mm. So the point of the 2025 in the name of the program was if you looked at the construction schedules on many of these, 2025 will really be a substantial completion date for many of the facilities and it will be pretty transformative. 30 seconds or less, what do you say to that person who says, I'll believe it when I see it? It's under construction. <laughs> that was definitely 30 <laughs> seconds or less. Yeah, under construction, you, you can see when the earth starts moving and things start going up in the air. Uh, and certainly a lot of people just hopeful that they'll get to see that. And then as this person, just this viewer just saying, get to enjoy it. Lori Boyer, I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, like I said, some great images online. It was pretty exciting. Thank you. All right. Well, stay with us uh, as we turn to Jacksonville's city election. I look forward to introducing you today to Brian Griffin. He is running for mayor. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. Don't go anywhere.
And if you're only joining me Sundays for This Week in Jacksonville, you're missing out. Be sure to subscribe to my weekly Twidge newsletter. It's a real bonus for News for Jacks insiders. Just head to newsforjacks.com slash newsletters and click to sign up under This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And our final qualified candidate interview among the people hoping to become mayor joining us right now. I want to introduce you to Brian Griffin. And uh, your name is not going to appear on the ballot. You're a write-in candidate. You're qualified. So explain to people how they vote for you if they don't see your name there on the ballot. Well, yeah, uh, look for the blank space underneath the list of can listed candidates. And uh, my name goes right underneath everybody else. Uh, just literally writing it, in. Writing just write it, it in. In. that's why I got to remember my name <laughs> so Brian Griffin why are you running you've run once before but tell us about uh, your campaign and why you want to be mayor in Jacksonville well I feel I from watching everybody else and seeing who's running and all I figure that uh, the city needs an alternative uh, just something different I'm uh, no party affiliation so there's no party politics and uh, um, uh, you don't have I won't change my mind in the middle of you know most people get elected and then the party politics kicks in and, and nothing ever, you know, gets done or half of it gets done. So I figure I can keep my promises. What are some of those promises? What are some of the things that you're running on to say, hey, choose me instead of somebody from one of the parties that you know? Well, um, I've, I've, I've actually looked into a lot of the ideas for well, crime. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a study in New York. They uh, uh, looked at, eight, or was it 80... Um, uh, public uh, uh, housing developments, and uh, they uh, found that with uh, just putting street lights in, uh, reduced crime by 39%. And I'm thinking, why aren't we doing that? Does that know? seem like a simple solution for you? Pretty simple, but I mean, that's just one, one idea. I mean, uh, problem with uh, drive-bys and, and uh, well, uh, uh, drive-bys and all that, if you slow the traffic down in those areas, you know, roundabouts, uh, um, anything to slow them down so they can't speed off. If they got to come in slow and go out slow, pretty unlikely they're going to commit crime, you know, shoot somebody on the way out kind of thing. So uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're asking viewers to submit questions. And so you're answering part of this, but I want to get your to weigh in on all of it. One of our viewers wants to know, what's your plan to curb crime in Jacksonville? Kind of talking about it. Yep. And how will you unite a divided city? What do you think about that? Well, I, f I find that, you know, if, if Everybody gets, you know, something out, you know, out of this, you know, out of a mayor. Uh, the um, people will be happy if they get, you know, most people are either you don't get anything or you get everything. If you get, you know, everybody gets something out of it, you know, the people will be happier. And if you make the city a, a more pleasant place to live, not only will you make the residents happy, but you'll, uh, you'll, uh, any new businesses coming in will, will, you know, would be encouraged because of, you know, lack of crime or, uh, you know, lack of flooding, uh, you know, if we, that's a, another important thing, uh, storm readiness is real important in this city, and uh, that affects everything, yeah. affects housing, affects crime, affects traffic, um, so if you give, you know, everybody gets a little bit, I think the city would be a lot happier. One of the things we're asking candidates, uh, this showed up many times from viewers. Uh, viewer Mark Musselwhite says, I don't want the taxpayers of Jacksonville to spend one penny on the estimated $1 billion of Shad Khan's new stadium. What are your thoughts? So clearly folks are, are concerned about, hey, whoever I elect for mayor, what are they going to do when it comes to partnering with the Jaguars, maybe even paying $500 million towards yeah. renovations or a new stadium? Well, I feel, I feel that... Um, we don't want to just spend to spend. I, I, I mean, the, Jacks, um, the Jacksonville Jaguars are very important to our city. It brings money into the city. We do need to keep it, keep them here. Um, I'm, but I'm not a not for spend, spend, spend. I feel like you should, you know, fix the problems that are there. Like you, they're talking about the renovation of, of the stadium right now, and uh, a lot of times when you hear that, it means they just want to fix everything. It's like go in and fix the problems that need to be fixed, and then as problems arise, fix those. So you don't have to renovate the whole stadium all at once, I don't feel. I've heard some of the candidates talk about hiring someone to negotiate or that kind of thing. Is that something that you would want to do yourself or is it something you would want to hire a negotiator? Um, I mean, I'd like to look at it myself first, but if, if need to be, you know, hire a negotiator. But I mean, 
most things are pretty obvious. You know, if you walk through a place, you can kind of tell what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. So um, I think I, yeah, negotiator is possible, but uh, I think it might be something we could do on our own. Plus, a negotiator is going to cost more money for the city. So. Brian Griffin, here's another viewer question. Mm -hmm. What can be done about the lack of affordable housing and the level of homelessness in Jacksonville? Affordable housing is something that uh, the entire state is dealing with as an issue. Yes, it is. Um, I, feel, I feel that we need to um, make or create more incentives to get builders and developments to, to have more affordable housing here. Um, it's, a, it's a big problem. And uh, if we don't uh, do something about it, it's just going to progressively get worse. I, I feel we should try different alternatives, uh, di bring different builders in, you can get different price ranges. Um, you might, might be able to even, if you get the right builders in here, you might be able to go from uh, a renter turning them into a, an owner. You know, and on all of that, there's uh, a the big thing nowadays, is tiny houses or tiny homes. You could put those anywhere. You could have a tiny home development anywhere, and that would be great for homelessness. You know, you could put it in the right areas for them, and, uh, and uh, it would be a controlled situation where, you know, the city oversees it so it doesn't, you know, become a, a, a mess or something. But it would be an alternative to, uh, to you know, get people off the street, basically. Because yeah. most people don't, you know, I'm sure the majority of people don't intend to be homeless. You know, they, that's their circumstance. Yeah. Yep. Brian Griffin, the circumstance is you're the write-in candidate, no party affiliated, and uh, we appreciate the time here as we interview all the candidates for mayor in Jacksonville this time. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> well, a reminder, you're going to find each of the mayoral candidates' interviews online at newsforjax.com and streaming on News for Jax Plus. This Week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Cat Justice. Thanks for watching. Why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida and South Georgia's number one source for local news.